So welcome back. And in this second video, we will discuss how EU tried to engage with its sovereign neighbors and what does it say about the EU as a global actor. I will have this very historical step-by-step -step approach looking at different periods of the EU engagement with the South and discussing in the very general features what was typical to them. So let's start from the very beginning and we start with the Mediterranean policies and I want you to keep that in mind. So the first sort of seeds of the engagement are actually in the 1957, the Treaty of Rome, where the European Economic Commission, uh, Community was founded. And several of these founders were actually colonial or post-colonial powers who were searching the ways to structure their engagement with their former colonies. So Treaty of Rome foresees and establishes certain clauses allowing to establish this specific particular relationships. This is the birth of European development cooperation, but also out of this search, a global Mediterranean policy emerged in the 1972, which basically is uh, composed of bilateral treaties, which foresaw the preferential trade relations with the European econ economic community and its partner and certain economic support in terms of loan or, or grants. So this framework changed through the time a little bit, but it was seen as insufficient due to the general changes taking place in the region. So there was Arab-Israel conflict, for example, happening, but also in the world. There was a fall of the Berlin Wall, so the end of the Cold War. European Union was born with the Maastricht Treaty. There were Oslo agreements signed, so there was this hope of the peace. So in general, except the Algerian civil war in the region, this was a rather positive uh, period with a high belief in the free trade, democratization, well, you know, the end of the history. In this context, in the 1995 Barcelona Declaration was signed by the, by the time already European Union and its South neighbors. And the main idea of this project was to create the prosperity sphere in the Mediterranean. And this prosperity should have been brought by three pillars, political, economic and social. As you can imagine, EU was still very much so economic project. The economic part was the biggest in the cooperation. And there was this idea of creating the free trade zone by 2010 in the Mediterranean. Spoiler alert, it failed. Mediterranean is one of the least uh, sort of integrated parts of the world. Uh, and a lot of uh, analysts sort of blame European Union for establishing rather hub and spoke. So each partner country is sort of trades more with the EU than with each other relations than actually building the economically integrated region. Politically, uh, political cooperation also stalled because of the conflicts in the region, fear of violence that may spread from the Algerian civil war, and in general, the European Union passed from the attempts to create a shared security space to securitizing its own security. As for the social cooperation, also there were attempts, for example, the creation of Anna Lind Foundation, which was supposed sort of to uh, build this Euro-Mediterranean cooperation, uh, identity even, maybe values. But as we know, uh, the prejudices, the fear of Islamism, uh, et cetera, et cetera, they are still persistent. So in that sense, not much has been done. And everyone sort of agreed that this framework did not give the fruits that was expected. But two biggest things that actually lead to the big change in the European attitudes towards its neighbors was one, 9-11. So everything turned to be about the security. Uh, European security strategy actually was published in 2003, the very same year when the US invaded Iraq and certain European countries supported it and others not. But another important element that happened during this time was this big bang enlargement to the east when suddenly there are eastern neighbors, which were not really something that European countries, all the European countries were used to deal with. So the European neighborhood policy was born and it was born uh, with the goal of, I'm quoting Roman Prodi, to create a ring of friends and sort of to promise everything but institutions to the newly and all the new and old European neighbors. And it's funny because this policy was a neighborhood policy, so the Mediterranean is gone, but it was rather similar to the accession policy in terms that uh, it had sort of some stru same structure. So the countries would sign partnership agreements, association agreements, in which they would agree on the partnership priorities, and then they would make midterm action plans 
uh, agreeing them with the European Union, which would help, which would support the implementation of the reforms outlined in these action plans. So that's something a little bit like pre-accession countries, just with the, without a membership perspective, so you can feel that it was um, uh, sort of making this, the carrot was not big enough to really push the countries to the certain reforms. The second part was that a lot of these reform, reforms or our discourse by that time, uh, and bear in mind in 2004 the concept of normative power Europe was coined, uh, spoke about the democratization and transformation of the countries. But many of the countries in the South were rather authoritarian regimes and they were not really willing, you know, to democratize. So European Union could talk a lot about democracy and support to civil society, etc., etc., whereas it was actually giving us support to the regimes that were far from these ideals. So I'm coming back a little bit to certain tensions mentioned by Ling and Florian, norms versus interest. But final, final, final push to the change was the Arab Spring. So European Union spoke about the democratization and supported those countries and engaged in the Mediterranean for a long time, but it sort of felt uh, to observe the existing social tensions. And if you look at the uh, European documents, it seems that Arab Spring sort of caught them uh, very unexpectedly. So people unhappy about the economic situation, unhappy about the uh, lack of democracy, social mobility, opportunities, etc., 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 started rather violent uprisings, and European Union said our framework is not sufficient. So first ENP review, took place in 2011, and the emphasis, unsurprisingly, was on deep democracy, on the real democracy. There was a promise of support for civil society rather than authoritarian governments. And there was also this promise that, you know, we should award more for war. So we should give more for those who are implementing the good reforms, who are trying, etc. There were more money promised. There were promises of mobility agreements with the countries. And there were promises of the bigger market uh, share in the form of deep and comprehensive free trades agreements. However, these appraisals turned into the bloody wars. So Libya, Syria, or coups like in Egypt. So European Union became very wary, you know. It, it was always this idea, shall we democratize or shall we keep the stability? So everyone was saying like, whoa, 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 democratization is not, you know, very stable thing. And the very last thing that really pushed European Union again to rethink its European neighborhood policy was, first of all, the war in Ukraine when Russia, for the first time, as a Russia in the modern times, invaded Ukraine. And the second thing was the huge migration crisis, which we had at our southern borders in 2015. So in 2015, EU conducts a very inclusive exercise asking what and how they should change in their neighborhood policy. And the review, it's very interesting, the 2015 review is actually talking about stabilization instead of transformation of its neighbor. It talks about differentiation, so working with, do, with those whom we can agree and working on the areas we can agree on. And it can be called rather pragmatic. So it's, it's a move, it's a shift from, you know, to transform your neighbors to sort of try to stabilize the neighborhood and to work with those with whom we can work. Obviously, the document says that we need to respect our values because our values are common values, but the tone is really scaled down. So if to sum up, European Union started saying we want to create a shared Mediterranean space. It moved to saying we want to transform our neighbors because we are normative power Europe to saying we want to stabilize the neighborhood. So from the Mediterranean space to ring of friends to extinguishing fires uh, in the ring of fire. Now, what does it say about the EU as an actor? Can we call EU normative? Well, Florian talked a lot about the problem with norms and interests. And I think European neighborhood uh, policy is really a good example that European Union often goes behind its interest. So stability and security instead of val uh, those uh, sort of European, if we can say, or Western values like democracy, participation, etc., etc. In that sense, majority of the actors most probably do the same. Uh, however, obviously, it tries to shape the normal because there is also a definition of normative power. It tries to shape the normal, building the rules, building agreements, etc., etc. And in that case, in that sense, various authors said that it's rather imperial or hegemonic maybe, but this engagement is really vertical. What do I mean by that? So 
Several authors agree that the European neighborhood policy is a top-down policy. It's not a policy that's built together with the neighbors, it's a policy that actually is built by the EU, by Europeans, for the neighbors to implement. In that sense, it's a vertical engagement, and the European Union really has an aim to, aim to change, to transform its neighbors according to how it sees the neighborhood should look like. And finally, is the European Union exceptional? So that was a little bit my question behind my doctoral research, where I compare the US Southern neighborhood policy and the EU Southern neighborhood policy after the two corresponding migration crises. In terms of willing to change its neighbors, uh, putting the effort to do that, no. The European Union is doing similar thing as the US is doing. In terms of the structures it creates, so this passion for structured cooperation, for rules-based cooperation, uh, its willingness to create and to pay for external regional, uh, uh, common sort of common regional goods, EU is well different than the US. I'm not sure if it's exceptional. There should be you know more researches, but we really can speak about certain specific Pax Europea or the order that the EU as an actor prefers. Can we transpose this observation to the global arena? On the one hand, no, because the EU does not have all the instruments it has in the neighborhood, in the global area. We can see that, for example, uh, Vladimir Putin is willing to talk not with the, with, the, with the European Commission, but rather with the separate presidents, or even better, with the US, instead of with the Europeans. Uh, however, the principles, the multilateral order, the rules-based order, etc., etc., I think it's coherent. We can see that European Union as an actor is trying to create this global order based on the similar, on somewhat similar principles. So I'm finishing here, and I just invite you to think about how both Southern neighborhood policy and the EU as a global actor or EU policy to achieve global goals will be changed by the Russia's invasion in Ukraine. I think in the upcoming years we'll see major changes. Uh, however, it's really early uh, to speculate and to see where they lead. But this is a very interesting time to study EU as an actor.